In today's video, I speak with PhD chemical physicist Chris Becker. Chris is a very interesting and humble individual. He has a very deep and broad scientific background, as well as a background in Zen Buddhism. The reason I spoke with Chris today is because of his most recent book, Healing with Psychedelics, Essays and Poems on Spirituality and Transformation. In this book, what he talks about is how he specifically worked on healing his own unique childhood traumas through guided psychedelic therapy. In today's video, you're going to see me and Chris discuss what exactly it's like to go through professional guided psychedelic therapy. We talk about all the phases of that experience, as well as many other layers to it. We also talk about specific strategies that we each can take in our own lives to recognize symptoms of childhood pain and trauma that we can cope with, possibly through psychedelic or meditative experiences. I really had a great time I'm speaking with Chris, and I think if you enjoy this channel, you're going to enjoy a very varied discussion between me and somebody that I look up to very much. I highly recommend you purchase Chris's book, link in the description below. It comes out on July 7th, and I think it only costs between $1 and $3. This is a great way that we can begin to support scientists that decide to speak out about their psychedelic experiences. All right, guys, without further ado, let's jump into our discussion. So yeah. glad to finally see you in person. Now we can kind of, now we can kind of yeah. connect. Well, I feel like I've been seeing you because I've been watching some of your videos. Oh, yeah? Nice nice to see you face to face, yeah. Nice to meet you. You're kind of a mentor of mine after reading some of your work. Well, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm here to try to help people, and uh, I can help anybody. And I especially uh, appreciate you have a younger audience, I think, mostly. And um, uh, maybe uh, I can help people avoid a few of the mistakes I made. Sorry to interrupt. I think you absolutely can help my audience, Chris. Um, Chris's book is largely focused on childhood trauma and how we can how we can potentially work through childhood trauma in facilitated psychedelic contexts. Is that fair to say? Right, right. With a guide, yeah. with a with a therapist guide, yeah. Yeah. So I'd love to hear um, more about what you define a guided context as, and maybe some of your own experiences. Well, guided context uh, in this case is more than just a sitter. It's not just uh, your friend and maybe even a friend who's done some journeys of their own. <clears throat> Somebody's actually had training and it might even take them a few years of training. And probably uh, the safest way to look at it is to find a guide who actually is part of a community, uh, a well-established community, because you don't become part of that community unless you're really trained. You're there, you're not accepted. So that may not always be easy to find those per, those kind of people, but uh, they are out there. And um, so that's, a, that's one thing about uh, being uh, finding a guide therapist. And um, so I recommend that for, we can get into why, you know, why, why people need therapy. And, yeah. uh, and I, I certainly didn't think I needed it for a long time. <laughs> maybe I'm in, maybe I'm still in denial myself. Um, before we jump right into the therapy thing, I have you know kind of a rough outline of sort of the stuff I wanted to ask you about or just uh, get your thoughts about. Sure, so, sure. Mm -hmm. in your book, you talk about an epidemic we have going on. You sort of start this chapter pretty intensely, saying that we have an epidemic that we need to address, and it's one that we're not addressing, and mm -hmm. that is of adverse childhood experiences. So, I would love right. if you would explain your thinking behind that and everything that goes with that. Right. Well, this is in the literature. In fact, uh, we hear a lot about the CDC and nowadays, we, you know, with the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, Center for Disease Control, CDC. Uh, the CDC actually on their website um, published a, a, a work originally, I think in the late 90s, uh, with uh, Kaiser Permanente, where they studied 17,000 individuals, uh, mostly Caucasian, middle class people, a lot of college educated. Southern California, I think out of San Diego. And um, what they found in that uh, large uh, set of people, you could say, you know, is this a certain type of population, but a big group of people. What they found that was about two thirds of them had uh, what were defined as adverse childhood events when they were children. And um, what are those kinds of events? Well, there's, there's a bunch of them in the list. Uh, you know, it can be really horrific things like beatings and sexual abuse, uh, but there also can be suicide in the family or attempted suicide, a divorce, um, uh, 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 violence against the female in the household. Um, so there's a, there's a wide range of those things, uh, including uh, emotional neglect. Uh, so some people think a trauma is like, well, something happened one day, you know, maybe you got hit one day or 
you were in an auto accident one day, but it can be the whole way you grew up. It could have been every day for years. Uh, somebody coined the phrase, um, death by a thousand paper cuts. And that can really, uh, it can really change who you are. And that's really what a lot of the message is, is that we adapt and naturally adapt. And that's a good thing because we adapt to survive. And, um, but the way we adapt actually hinders us as we become adults. We have, uh, some people say we wear a mask or you know, we have armor on um, and uh, we behave in certain patterns that we're generally unaware of. And people talk about personalities or schemas um, and you kind of think, oh, you know, that's gonna, blah, 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 you know, not to mean anything. But it turns out if you really watch people, um, you find that they really do behave in ways that they're pretty much unaware of. And it's usually because they're hiding a lot of pain, internal pain that they've repressed mostly. Some people don't even have these kind of childhood memories where they had these terrible events. Some of them happen as infants that we still carry with us, you know, even before uh, memory centers are developed. Um, and, um, but, the, but that's, a, that's, you know, if you think of two thirds of the population, and then I actually think the, the number is larger because there's, uh, I have a friend, my editor actually, we, we talked about it. She grew up in a uh, family with um, a very uh, uh, religious, uh, Christian, very strict uh, religious beliefs. And she talked to me about like, you know, how she was corrected, you know, how she had to do things a certain way. And that correction over and over uh, through your life changes you. And, uh, and you behave, and you do things different, you see the world differently and um, it covers up our true self. And so I think what psychedelic medicines can do with a, with a good person to help you, because it's just so hard to do it by yourself. Uh, they can, you can find that inner person and let them out. That's, that's, first of all, very well spoken. That is interesting. That really makes me think, I, I think you're completely right, because while my first naive, very high dose uh, psilocybin experience did shed, it did shed these layers of falsity and bring me back to a true self. There was this lack of, it, it, you almost imagine like wet clay not being able to be molded properly. Like, like I, the experience was there, but from there, actually, there's been a, a YouTuber recently who, um, this is a bit of a side note, who had a very profound, uh, you might say, transcendent experience of the type I'm talking about. And because it wasn't guided or facilitated in any sort of way, he sort mm -hmm. of came down from it with a, a very narrow messiah type of uh, complex, you might say. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think you're, you're dead on and you're dead on about this need for a guide. Right. It's really, I mean, I, I was in my, uh, in the book I talk, that I talk about that I did some psychedelic experiences when I was in my 20s. And um, they were kind of like an appetizer, you might say. They were, they were mostly good and I got something from them. I don't I want to say it was a I feel like I'm talking to Obi-Wan right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I got a sense of the mystical aspect of the world, that there's something more than just, uh, you know, the objects, uh, you know, that we- Molecular pick machines. Up the cold and whatever. Um, and that was good. It gave me that sense of awe a little bit. Although, um, you know, then I got into my worldly things and, you know, career and family and, you know, they kind of go sideways for, for a long time. But um, um, it was only, uh, and this, this is the way it happens for a lot of people and the way it happened for me. Something brings you to therapy. There's some event usually, and it can be uh, a death in the family. It could be an auto accident. It could be, um, in, in my case, it was my wife and brother both talking to me and saying, you have to quit drinking. And it was that pressure. Otherwise, I would have been, I'd still be uh, opening up the bottle of wine tonight, probably. And um, so it was that pressure. Some event, something catalyzes or is an impetus to the change. And that's, and I'd, I'd like to, to ask, uh, your uh, your listeners to don't wait for that if you don't have to try to try to look inside and, and look for symptoms that's what i'd like to say so the symptoms are there if you're willing to look for them yeah what are some ways what are some ways we can look in at those symptoms 
Well, just uh, recognize what a symptom is, and if you're honest about it, so it's it's every day or nearly every day uh, drinking alcohol or smoking pot or doing something that you got to do it. Or it's you know sex. I got to have a lot of sex before, to feel right, or um, you know I really got to get my car going, and you know I got to. I got. I like to shop. I like to shop, and I, maybe I eat too much, or maybe I have anorexia. There's a, a many, many different things that we use to uh, uh, keep the pain at bay, and uh, these are these are symptoms, and they're recognizable if you're honest about it. You can see them. And you can also see them in you know your friends and family too, and um, but it's a tough it's a tough job to get people to to do something about it because uh, there's something right about addiction, for example, uh, it, it uh, covers up the pain. It does something that, you know, it serves a, a purpose. And there's also uh, depression, you know, that's another uh, symptom. Depression is pretty common. Anxiety, people are nervous and worried a lot and things aren't quite right and, you know, they just uh, have a lot of anxiety. So those are some of the common symptoms that, as I said, you know, really the majority of our population suffer from. I just I want to add one more thing, and that is uh, you know I mentioned about addictions of all sorts and shapes, but another one that's really important I'd like your your uh, your viewers to keep in mind is how we relate to other people, and uh, it, it manifests in all kinds of relationships you know your ne your next door neighbor whatever but especially especially those close relationships like with a significant other, you know, and in my case. Uh, this was part of my my childhood trauma, like what it did to me. I had um, a, what, what they call, the psychologists would call an avoidant attachment style. And I don't want to get into psychology, but basically what it means is uh, my relationships were contaminated by fear. A fear of it, uh, not being loved, not really being accepted, and then not trusting. Uh, if you, that's your background. That's and mine you, personally. Yeah, and when you can't trust, well, your partner, your partner picks that up, right? And they may have their own thing too, uh, and you know, and these two patterns can play against each other and all. But um, uh, and when your when your relationship is contaminated with fear, you're not trusting, not feeling safe, uh, that comes from those childhood injuries. Uh, it has it does bad things for your relationships. It's hard to really accept yourself in the relationship it's really hard to accept your partner as they are and you tip and frequently um, you see as a result unstable relationships and you and uh, you know maybe it lasts a year they break up and like oh you know I you know I, I didn't really like her that much or you know she just had this irritating thing she would do and or whatever you know or in my case I really tried hard but uh, I had the uh, two two failed uh, marriages. They were both uh, more than ten years. Uh, two children from the first one, but I basically basically uh, you know all my childhood injuries made them unstable, and it was a, it was a lot of work just to keep them together for ten years. And there was a lot of unhappiness in that time together because I didn't feel safe, I didn't feel trusting, and that manifests in how we relate, especially to that close person. You know, maybe we're trying to share our life with and. They may have their own things going on too. So that's another symptom, a really important one, besides you know addiction and depression and anxiety. Lately, something um, that I've noticed is, maybe there's a better Eastern words for this, is sort of the vanishing goal. I, I've noticed as I've, I've had a bit of success this year online um, in becoming more popular, and it's very fascinating to watch the mind set these destinations it seems it thinks will be nirvana and then reaching them and then it's almost like reaching the rainbow and there was no there's no rainbow there and then mm -hmm. you see it in the distance again and you're mm -hmm. constantly that's why i'm so fascinated by um your background with meditation because i i've begun in my own life to notice these patterns of grasping that i just cannot escape from and actually funny enough uh, i'm noticing that i'm grasping to get away from them so so mm -hmm. I, so mm -hmm. i don't i don't know where the grasping exactly ends but i guess right. there's Pure acceptance, perhaps. Right, acceptance. Um, I think the grasping. Uh, I don't want to. I'm not trying to psychoanalyze you, Quinn. But uh, please usually do. For, <laughs> usually, <laughs> usually for people, it's like something's missing. So you want something. There's something missing in your life, and uh, I like to say uh, I'm not the only one who uses this phrase, but a hole in your heart. 
there's something, there's a hole there that you need to book. be fill, filled up. And it, it, it manifests, you know, with alcohol or pot or, or searching for something, to, you know, maybe grasping for something, some goal, uh, or you got to get a nicer car or you got to get a prettier girlfriend or, you know, whatever it is uh, that's got to, you know, you, you need something to kind of fill The next thing. Hole. The next thing, right. That's a, a very uh, astute um, symptom. Is that a trap? You know? Uh, 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 let's see, I guess you could call it a trap. I'm not sure it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's sort of a trap you can fall into. That's right. And, um, a hole, you could even say it's a hole you can fall into mm. and, um, you can fall into that hole and, um, and it's hard to get out of it because, um, you know, you don't know how, because a lot of, you know, we think as we grow old, especially in, in when we're young, when you're young adults, you know, 20s and 30s, we think, well, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm not a teenager anymore. I know a lot of stuff. And I'm a smart guy, smart girl. And, you know, but, you know, maybe, you know, we haven't all got it figured out because there's a lot to figure out. And um, there's a lot in our, that comes from our childhood. That's what I talk about uh, often is that it's repressed. It's, it's hard to see. Um, and that's why a skilled person can help you kind of get that out and help you, help you bring that to light, get it out of the unconscious and get it into the conscious. And when it gets into the conscious, then you really can work on it. And then also the psychedelic medicines, uh, can help you work on it, but it, it, also they can help get it out of the unconscious too. That's another aspect of their beauty and power is to help bring those things out of the unconscious into the conscious where you can really work on and heal. That's, that's a great segue because I wanted to ask you um, how you, I wanted to kind of go back to the beginning of your interest in not necessarily mysticism, but just spirituality and maybe psychedelic experiences and things like that. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to hear, hear about what it did for you. Those first attempts at uh, altering your consciousness by meditation, et cetera. Right. But the biggest um, altering of my consciousness was with peyote, really. Mm. I, although I did some uh, meditation early on and I started in my 20s, um, I was mostly just um, thinking idle thoughts when I was sitting. So I'm not so sure. I mean, you know, I was doing some work to, you know, to make a, to, you know, doing some uh, leg work or some grounding, you know, to get started. But the, the actual insights were probably from peyote. Um, and, um, which is powerful, powerful medicine, and I have respect for it a lot. And even though I didn't, it didn't take me, you know, really as far as I could have gone if I had a guide and had done a lot of other work around it. Still, it was uh, eye-opening, and it and it, uh, you know, it opens your mind and your heart to the sense of uh, sense of uh, that there's more here, and um, you may not be able to exactly name it or like have total, you know. I, re I got it. I really, really get it. But you get a sense of like, yeah, there's just some beauty here. And there's, you know, how do you know, we always ask ourselves like, hey, how did I get here? How did I get in this body? Why this body? What and the hell is going I, on? Yeah, yeah. What is this all about? <laughs> and, um, and so I think the peyote, the peyote was uh, a taste, I think, uh, that you could get a sense of the sacred. Um, so that's a taste that of the here. sacred. Yeah, the biggest eye-opening, I think, in my 20s. All right, so moving through maybe your 20s, as, you, as you're as you moving into your, maybe it's your 30s, I'm, I'm curious how this how this molds into more of a spiritual practice. Was it after experimentation with more types of psychedelics or realizing that psychedelics are only a taste? Um, yeah, I think psychedelics were a, a taste, but then I, I did get into meditation. And, you know, and I'd read books and, and maybe some of your listeners or your viewers have read books too. And it can kind of sound exciting if you write, read certain books, you know, and um, like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, I want to do that too. I mean, I want to get there too. I want to, I don't want to have to just sit here all the time. I want to get there. And uh, there's a lot of just sitting there too. But I stuck with it. Um, and um, if you do stick with it, um, I think you can, uh, you can, you can have the practice mature to the point where you understand what's really happening. And, um, but it takes some work. It takes some patience. And a little bit in the book, I talk about some problems that people have when they meditate 
Um, mind wandering is probably the number one problem. Uh, every instructor says, oh, don't worry about it, it's okay. Everybody does that, it's normal. But people, they, they have a hard time accepting that. They want it to go away, I wanna get there now. And so, and when that mind wandering doesn't stop, you know, they get frustrated and they say, oh, screw it. Or, you, know, you know, it's like- uh, I, mean, I tried you know, meditation and I failed, that's awesome. <laughs> that's right. And a lot of that comes from childhood of uh, not being good enough, uh, not being okay. And like, uh, and self-criticism, even though the instructor might say, oh, normal, it's normal. You know, mind wandering is normal. But still, after a while, you get frustrated, like, oh, I'm not good at this. I, you know, my mind is just not cooperating. and um, it's very, uh, uh, it's not easy in that regard. And so a lot of it, if uh, I'd like to recommend to people is, uh, don't worry about like following your breath when those things happen. Try to understand, be curious about your mind. Like, why are you upset about this? What's actually going on? So spend your attention, you know, be curious and put your attention there. You can go to back to your breath later or whatever you're using, but, um, um, but a, a good teacher is good is good for that too. But uh, I have but, noticed um, in others uh, and myself, there's this path, there's this first recognition of uh, the pathology of the mind. You know, the constant thinking that actually you're realizing is happening to you rather than uh, deliberately coming from within. And I think that if that is combined with individuals who may have, like you said, a childhood tied perfectionist streak or fear of failure. Um, and then, you know, there's this common trope of meditation is to clear your mind. Most people probably try to meditate and quickly are like, oh, I cannot meditate. Certainly this thing in my head, this is not capable of meditating. Right. But there's some false expectations. I think it's pretty, you know, people advertise, you know, oh, it's going to be peaceful. And like you, you run, sometimes you run into some younger people. No offense. I was a younger person. And they go, oh, I've been meditating for two years, man. It's great. And like, I'm kind of like. <laughs> I'm not even at a year yet. I, I'm kind of thinking like, mm, yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it can take a while, and uh, and it's really easy to get frustrated and really easy to quit. So we're going through life with these with these symptoms that you just described, and you've briefly also described your first peyote experience and how that gave you a glimpse at maybe a different type of a different type of potential state of being. And so mm -hmm. I want to kind of keep going along your own personal journey here. Um, what do you think was the next the next the next step in this journey? Uh, your psychedelic or spiritual uh, investigation to find out what's going on here? Well, I think my, um, I had a couple, the peyote journeys I had in my 20s were really, I think overall quite, quite positive. Um, I had one, a couple of LSD journeys. The last one I think the, that made me stop was a 24 hour journey. And I was getting anxious towards, uh, you know, after, 20 hours or whatever, okay, am I going to come down, you know, mm -hmm. I think Maybe I, was not. Like, okay. I was like, okay, that was good, I'm, I think I'm done with LSD for now, and, um, and then I had, uh, I think only one uh, mushroom journey, and, and it kicked my butt, and, and it kind of told me that um, you're not ready to do this, um, and, um, and it was rougher than the peyote, uh, and much rougher. I don't know. I might have been a big dose. Like I said, uh, I know we didn't we didn't even measure. It. I have no idea how much we took. Um, and uh, it was fresh mushrooms, Mexican mushrooms, and um, uh, but it really kicked my ass. <laughs> and, <laughs> That's uh, how you and, know you took enough. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and uh, it wasn't a it wasn't a good thing. And um, but it was like the earth medicine uh, teaching me a lesson. You know, it was like it was really like. Don't fuck around. You're not ready for this. You're not doing it right. And, uh, you know, it I'm is stern. You, and I'm going to teach you a lesson. And uh, so I think that was my last journey in my 20s. So I kind of like uh, did that. And then I got off into the career and the family and all that, you know, kind of worldly stuff, pay the mortgage and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't really, um, my meditation did improve, but I kind of hit a plateau. Where I could see some spiritual light, but and I thought, oh, you know, I got it, I got it, and um, and I, you know, I'm all good now. And but um, you're not really that deep, and um, uh, and so I got um, uh, you know, kind of a, a cavalier about it, I guess you might say, and kind of let that let that go, 
and then it was, you know, and then really the, uh, all the, you know, problems kind of surfaced slowly and I try to manage them, you know, as best I could. Never drank at work or anything like that. Never got a DUI. But uh, then the incident with my uh, wife and brother coming to me and telling me, you know, hey, you, really, you got to quit, quit drinking. Mm. That was, that was it. And, um, and, uh, and they, and my brother in particular was saying, well, what are you going to do about it, right? You can try cold turkey, but you know, that doesn't really generally work. So what's your plan? So I said, um, I give me a few days, I'll, I'll do some research. And so I went online and I had come across, um, you know, I looked into AA, it didn't seem like it was my thing and looked into some other things and just talk therapy didn't seem quite it. And I came across Michael Pollan's book. Many of your, your viewers probably know of it, how, how to change your mind. The Trojan horse. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, in, in the, especially in the beginning of that book, uh, he talks about some of the history of the research and addiction, treating addiction was, is very clear in there and, and depression, anxiety. And I thought, well, you know, I'll, why don't I try this? Cause you know, I felt comfortable with the psychedelics from my twenties. I didn't feel afraid of them. Um, and, um, uh, I, my, you know, my brother and my wife were saying, you know, what's your plan? You know? So, uh, so then what happened for me is, so I went online um, trying to find somebody. And I Googled around and searched and, and whatnot. And I found an article on Medium uh, that was written by uh, my above ground, uh, who turned out to be my above ground therapist. It was really very well written, very balanced about the state of the art or, or state of knowledge with psychedelic assisted therapy. And he had spent a couple of years in Peru uh, at an ayahuasca retreat center helping like an assistant shaman. So he obviously knew that world and he was actually trained, licensed, had gone through a lot of the training, you know, uh, as a psychotherapist, uh, licensed. And he, he was above ground, so he didn't uh, use those med medicines in the United States. Sometimes he would, you know, take some people to Peru or something. But anyway, he obviously knew that world and, and was well trained. I liked, he seemed like a nice guy from what I read and really smart and you know, relaxed guy. So anyway, so I contacted him and asked him if I could uh, come see him for therapy. And um, so I did. He's in San Francisco. And um, um, and I said, you know, you know, I'm really interested in the psychedelic assisted therapy. And blah, blah. he said, well, you know, uh, let's just uh, let's just slow it down. Let's just slow it down. Let's just do some talk therapy for a while. Let's just uh, it's just let's go through, uh, you know, what's going on? Why are you here? You know, tell me about your life and do some work. Right, scribbling <laughs> notes. Yeah. And so for about three or four months, that's all we did. We just did talk therapy, a weekly session. And uh, and at some point, then he said, you know, okay, you know, okay, you know, I'll connect you to a friend of mine who uh, does some underground work here, and so uh, in the Bay Area, and so that's how I started to work with him. He's actually also trained as a therapist. And uh, I started with him too, just doing talk therapy. You want to, you know, you want to build a relationship. Uh, you, cause you want to make sure it's a right relationship. You want to have some trust. And, uh, and you know, and he was trying to learn about me too. I mean, the other guy, you know, I'm sure, you know, talked to him on the phone about me, but you know, he wanted firsthand to learn about me and learn about my past and learn how I operate. You could go out and watch me operate. And a lot of it is not the storyteller, excuse me, it's not a bit, a lot of it is not the story, it's the storyteller. That's what uh, he's looking for. What you, how are you acting? What do you, how do you organize your experiences? Uh, is that to you, say, what is your self narrative you're embedded in sort of? Yeah, yeah, that, and you know, just how you, how your past has affected how you see the world and how you behave in the world. And he can ask you questions and see how you respond, watch your body motions, how you do certain things. And uh, get to that's kind of scary. Kind of scary, but really beautiful. I bet. When, when it's when somebody who's actually uh, knows what they're doing, and then and then we started the uh, the psycho the psychedelic assisted therapy, mm -hmm. and uh, it was very powerful. And uh, we started off. I should go on and tell you a little bit more about that. How that I went. would love to hear about that, my friend. Okay, so um, the first uh, uh, we started with MDMA. Uh, which is a kind of the standard recipe. I'm sure there's some exceptions, but that's kind of the standard recipe is a couple of MDMA journeys before doing some mushroom uh, journeys. 
and uh, especially the first couple uh, were very centered on my early childhood, my parents and my, and, you know, my early childhood, my trauma, my personal trauma, understanding that, bringing it up and uh, healing it. And uh, it was very deep work, uh, pretty strong doses of MDMA, very heart opening. I really released my emotions. Um, you probably can feel now, like before it was all closed off. Would you mind, um, uh, would you mind explaining perhaps what, what the room looks like? I'm very interested. Right. And so this is, uh, I've been doing a few of them outside too, we can talk about, but most of these were inside. It was in a safe house, in a room, um, a blind, uh, eye shades on. Um, so it's very introspective. Uh, so you're lying on a, a, a little mattress, you know, you're comfortable. Uh, there's a cover if you're warm or, or if you're a little bit cool, you know, you can have a cover on, pillow. You get very comfortable, but it's all introspection uh, with the eye shades. And uh, uh, he'll typically uh, play some music on a, you know, a little recording system. Um, he has, it's appropriate, kind of evoke feelings. Um, and there may be some talking and he'll have a notepad. And uh, when I talk, you know, he'll, he'll typically write down you know, things I've said and we'll review them uh, 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 afterwards. And so really I should mention, you know, there's, the, there's a, a preparatory work, you know, the intentions. I think most of your, your viewers might know this. It's not just set and setting, but well, the, the, uh, the setting is also like working on your intentions. What are you gonna work on, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the integration afterwards. That's also yeah. an important part of it. But so the therapy was uh, with eye uh, shades on, lying down, uh, comfortable with some music, with the guide there to support you. Uh, if you needed uh, uh, to hold his, your hand, his hand, or you put your, mm. his hand on your heart. That could be powerful, I'm sure. It'd be very powerful. And, um, um, and there's an art to it, a skill to it. I mean, you could say art, but skill. I mean, th these people have been trained how to do this. So that's the thing I'd like to encourage your, your viewers, if they want to try these things, they have to find a person. It may not be too easy, but I think if you network enough, um, especially if they're part of a community, they're not, uh, you know, Joe Blow decides that he's a shaman and, you know, he yeah. wants, to, wants to do this. So somebody who Would, really has a significant amount of training. And so it's really therapy. Would you mind uh, describing some of the criteria that you used in your own uh, the, your own discovery of the best guide for you uh, if people decide to go look for themselves? Well, I, I was fortunate, I think. I found this gentleman online. Um, he's actually in the, in the acknowledgments of my book, uh, Above Ground. And so he was connected to the community. So I worked with him. And so I got to know him. And he did some really good work with me. So I, you know, respected his his capabilities, and he, and like I said, he had done this a couple of years in Peru, so he was totally knowledgeable about this kind of work, and um, and then he handed me over to somebody he trusted, so mm -hmm. that was it was an easy, you know, fortunate path for me, but um, it may not be that easy for everybody, you know, especially maybe if you're not in a major cosmopolitan area, um, you might have to look harder. Um, but take your time. Uh, it's important to find uh, somebody who's well trained, who really knows what they're doing. So that's um, that's great. Network, network, I guess you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to help some of our audience there. Yeah, no, I, that's a really important question. Is that, you know, if you say, okay, well, that sounds good. How do I find that person? I can't, you know, I can't just Google and go, oh, why am I? You know, it doesn't work that way. No dating so, app for a trip guide yeah, yet. You're going to have to find somebody who, um, you know, network some way. In my case, it was with an above uh, ground therapist who was connected. Mm. That's probably a pretty good way that will at least work for some of your, some of your viewers. Mm. Okay. So we move into these, uh, we're moving past the uh, preparatory phase and we're beginning to do the administration phase. So I would love to hear uh, with the various substances what that is like. Well, uh, it started with two MDMA journeys, and that was a, a lot of the healing was with those two, first two journeys. They were very focused on my intentions about childhood trauma that I had suffered. Uh, I had some photographs of my family, especially parents. Mm. On, the, on the altar, there's an altar there. That's a sacred space. Fascinating um, altar. 
Yeah, there's an altar there. And actually, I should mention as a, as the beginning of the, uh, at least in this community, as the beginning of the of the journey, we would, uh, uh, before, you know, ingesting anything, uh, we would have um, um, like a little ceremony uh, before the altar. Like you would take some uh, smoking sage. Maybe some of your audience know about that. Maybe not. Uh, it's a common um, Native American uh, tradition, a purification. Uh, we would say a prayer. Um, and uh, I would tip, bring something, a couple things from home and put on the altar too, but there were some other things already on the altar. So it's a spiritual environment. Um, you don't have to believe if you don't, you know, if you don't want to, you don't, you know, nobody's going to force you to believe anything. And nobody's there proselytizing or trying to make you believe anything. It's just an I offering. I think that's important. Yeah, it's just a, an offering um, that um, uh, to, you know, for people who feel, that who, these people are very experienced journey, journeying themselves, that there's a spiritual world and they feel connected to it. And so they, um, they respect it and they want to help, uh, help you connect to it. And it, it's helpful for the journey and helpful for the healing, I think. Mm. I think that's beautiful. I think reincorporating these, I mean, we can only imagine how long humans have implemented some form of an altar in their ritual. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's just these ancient, these ancient uh, subroutines in the brain we may be activating, this, this deep wish to, to set intention and to worship uh, right. symbols, whether or not they have magic or not. It's personal magic in my view. Right. The community I'm involved with uh, have gotten a lot of their knowledge from indigenous people in a respectful way, in a way that's the asking, the sharing, and learning. Uh, some from a Mexican a tribe in uh, the outside of Oaxaca, but some other tribes too. Uh, so these people have been doing it for millennia. And, uh, and so it's done, uh, it's not done for fun. It's always done for healing and, uh, and spiritual growth too. So that's the context. We, we're, we've taken these two preparatory MDMA not preparatory, but uh, MDMA sessions that have sort of uh, primed you for, for healing. And right. I would love to hear what these psilocybin uh, guided experiences were like as well. Well, uh, after the two MDMA, uh, the, the next one, and I've done a bunch after that with mushrooms. Um, and um, they, uh, I have a name for it I use in my book. Uh, I call them the celestial washing machine. So it's kind of, uh, it's sort of descriptive. I mean, it cleans you, but it's gonna toss you around a bit too. Like you're in, you know, you see the agitator <laughs> moving in the washing machine. It's like, it's kind of doing that to you too. Shaking stuff out, you know, stuff coming out from the unconscious. Stuff that uh, needs to come out. You know, somehow it finds like what that, where those places are that are hidden that we otherwise might not be able to access. And, um, so those journeys are rough, a little bit rougher. The MDMA is beautiful, heart opening, and, and profound. Uh, but it's a good way to start the therapy. And then, and then we migrated to the mushrooms, which are a little bit harder. You get maybe a little used to them, but you never get totally used to them. They're always, they're always something you, you treat with a lot of respect. I'm sure you can understand that. I mean, you have your own experiences. But, uh, uh, I've certainly learned my lessons from not doing that. All right, you can't, you can't take them for granted. Yes. And there would still be intentions. We would still be working on things. A lot of them, uh, after a first a few of my uh, journeys, they weren't so much uh, family oriented anymore. I felt like I kind of at least did most of that healing. I got to those places, brought out a lot of really early childhood things and, and worked on healing with my guide. Um, then it became more of um, just opening up my mind and my heart trying to be, uh, the way I like to say it, uh, is, uh, you know, become a, a, a better bodhisattva. That is, you know, just try to help people. And so you have to kind of help yourself to get in that position, to be open, willing to feel compassion for people, um, take your time with people, uh, understand that they have, uh, you know, their own things they're trying to work through and be compassionate about that. And just trying to learn more about the world Learn more about yourself. There's always still places to learn and grow. As you're in this chaotic state, are you kind of uh, referring to them for, for help and, and uh, stability? I'm curious how that plays out 
having somebody kind of uh, not necessarily hovering over you, but in your presence. Right. Uh, well, there are different moments in the journey. You know, journey is several hours, right? And a, lo a lot of times, I'll, I think with the MDMA, you tend to be a little more talkative, which is natural. And again, he'll, typically there'll be a pad of paper there, and he'll be writing down things, and we'll talk about them later if I'm, you know, if I'm saying certain things. Um, usually a little less talking with the mushrooms, but they're still talking. Um, he may uh, come over, though. Some, well, he will come over periodically if I'm quiet. Um, he'll come over and ask me, how are you doing? You know, be very, he'll just kind of come over and make a little bit of noise and come over and whisper in your ear, how are you, how are you doing, Chris? You're and, a human, Chris. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then he'll get me to talk a little bit, you know, or he might say, well, where are you now? Or, you know, things like that. Uh, just so, he, so he gets, um, you know, it's fine to do a lot of internal processing, but it's helpful to get some of it out. So he, he can help you work with it. It's so like you're digging up pay dirt. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but sometimes I'll just say things, you know, they'll just come up um, and he'll write them down typically. And occasionally, you know, I get into a, a difficult spot. He'll come over and, and uh, you know, he'll hold my hand very tightly or he'll, uh, you know, put his hand on my heart. And um, um, so he'll do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. He's very <clears throat> skilled at kind of, judging where you are and what you need. And he doesn't want to be intrusive, right? Because the medicine is doing most of the work. You actually, you're doing most of the work. The medicine is just helping you. And he's there to help you too. And he's just looking for, uh, to be supportive. And when he needs to get involved, he will get involved. And other times he'll just kind of let you go. So he's, it's a very a skilled uh, way to be with somebody. That's what fascinated, fascinates me most about um, this psychedelic therapy being uh, undergone, I guess you could say, is that the mechanism does not necessarily seem to be like described by, you know, a, 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 like an electron flow chart. You know what I mean? Like this is, this is a encounter with yourself and an abstract experience that allows you to heal yourself like that 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 i find fascinating it's not so much oh this uh triggered a cascade of effects downstream while it might what's most important is that you have this encounter with the unconscious it seems right and i think that you um part of it is, is learning and accepting that you have a natural everybody has a natural ability to heal themselves but it's not uh easily come by and these medicines with the right guide, with the right therapist, uh, really can help you do that. It's really tough, I think, to just, you know, drop acid or drop some mushroom, eat some mushrooms and uh, expect it's all going to get better. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's uh, very difficult to do it that way. So, um, uh, but, but nevertheless, uh, it's, you are healing yourself. The medicines are helping you. They're very powerful, as I'm sure many of your viewers know. Um, and the doses are usually pretty high. Um, and, um, and, you know, with eye shades on, this is not, we're not uh, going out into the, the beach or, you know, looking around and going to a party for sure. And um, mm -hmm. uh, even Would you ever couple, be interested in an uh, outdoor context? Would you ever be well, interested? Well, I've done, actually, it's worth mentioning. Uh, in fact, yesterday I did a journey outside this i think is my third journey outside it was in a redwood forest i can see the glow in your eyes yeah 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 there's still, yeah, there's still some you look like you're 25 <laughs> that's right um it's in a, it was in a redwood forest a very beautiful you know very tall tall redwood trees so it's a beautiful setting very quiet you know birds chirping away from the road noise and, and, and very few airplanes uh very quiet setting in, na in nature, you feel like in nature, but I still was lying on a mat with my eye shades most of the time. You know, towards the end, I, you know, I would take my eye shades off when I was coming down, and I'm looking up at these tall redwoods right above me. Wow. And it's, uh, you have the feeling of nature, but it's still an introspection uh, journey. Mm, mm. What a feeling of presence that must give you to just be underneath these massive uh, intelligent networks. Yeah, really. Looming above you. Right. Some of the trees are so tall. It's like, wow. You just look at them with awe. You know, I'm up here in Washington and we don't really have uh, necessarily the same tallness to our trees, but we have enough of them. You know, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So I'm curious how 
you, when you reflect on your experiences contrasting things like peyote to LSD and psilocybin, which do you think have the most have the most potential uh, to people who aren't familiar with these types of states? In, in terms of being healed in the right context. Right. Um, if it's, are you saying like a do it yourself experience? Is Not necessarily. Um, you know, maybe we can't have the perfect scenario where we have a trained therapist, but we have a trusted lifelong friend who we would never, who would never betray us in a safe room. Um, mm -hmm. Which substances do you think facilitate that type of uh, digging up the pay dirt from the, from the unconscious? Well, the, the general procedure that um, this community uses of the two MDMA journeys first, followed by mushrooms, I think is pretty, is, is really outstanding. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, the MDMA is a heart opening uh, drug. You can actually have a, a mystical experiences with them, although they're not all that common. But I was lucky to have one the first time I did it. But mostly they're really heart opening. They also just bring out not just the emotions, but what's really on your mind and what's really in your heart, what, what you're really working on. And um, so MDMA uh, with the right dose, not too much, not too little, um, is a wonderful uh, beginning. Uh, peyote is pretty tough uh, on the system. Um, uh, though, I, you know, I don't want to say anything against it because it's, it's been used by Native Americans for, you know, thousands of years. It's really powerful. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty impressed by the routine. I don't know if routine is the right word, but the procedure, I guess, that this community uses, starting with a couple of MDMA, open up the heart, open up the emotions, and then, then, then you become more open. And then the other medicines maybe can work more effectively. Mm -hmm. And the mushrooms are earth medicines. There are other medicines, too, that can be very powerful. And, and as I've done more and learning more, uh, my guide has introduced me to some other ones. But I, I went with mushrooms for quite a while. Uh, mm -hmm. just, it's just a very good path, I think. I would like to ask you also, how do you feel your, how do you feel your experiences with uh, meditation, however, however successful or unsuccessful, how do you feel they helped you during these experiences? That's a, that's a very good question. And vice versa, how did those experiences help my meditation? I think ah. they, they're both... Uh, they have in some kind of a good loop, I think. You're living in 2200. I didn't even think of that. The, uh, I think the meditation did help. Um, and it may be subtle and it's maybe not hard, easy to describe how or why, but it maybe allowed me to stay with the experience a little bit more steadily. Um, you know, meditation is kind of a focus. Uh, a mind focus you, is one way to sort of describe it. You can focus on an object, but there's also open open awareness meditation where you, it's like you're sitting on a, on a train looking out the window and the, the scenery goes by, you just watch it. You don't judge it, you don't react to it, you just watch it. But that's also a kind of focus. So I think it can have a concentration, ability to help your concentration, ability to help you steady yourself, so you don't get carried away so much by you know something jumping up at you in your unconscious uh, not that you push it away but you you can watch it come and and be with it and allow it to, to do what it needs to do so i think the meditation can help you in that way uh i, I do so i really do I, I encourage it we can talk about different kinds of meditation but i would love to but uh that's i think it is a helpful practice and it may take a while for that to develop and then for me at least in my particular case uh, the psychedelic assisted uh, therapy uh, made a big difference in my meditation. How deep I could go, uh, being able to visualize spiritual light uh, just totally it like uh, turned me up a whole nother notch or another level or however you want to say it. It was extremely, um, extremely valuable and, and beautiful and, and, and that felt healing too. Uh, one of my therapists does a lot of meditation and he, he just said, well, you just, uh, you know, you re remove the block, you know, and then it's not like a, maybe a chakra block or something. I'm not really sure if it's a chakra, but you move maybe something, you remove the block. And so it just allowed me to open up much more. My meditation quickly became much deeper. 
I wanted to ask you as well, somebody who definitely has more experience than me in this, this domain is, how do you get past this? This is actually what I forgot earlier. How do you get past this, this seeming paradox of trying to meditate? How, how, how does one get past this? Because, you know, hopefully you understand what I'm saying here. I'm sitting down and I have the intent to self better. And yet that seems to actually be a production of the entire ego construct or whatever you might want to call it. I'm sitting there trying to convince myself I'm now my higher self. Sometimes it feels like, especially me, you know, I, I don't have even a year of solid, consistent meditation. So really I'm convinced I'm essentially fooling myself. I'm, you know, I, I've translocated to the higher self, the higher Quentin, uh, but who's, who's criticizing that? So I, I it really, I don't know when it ends. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, uh, I think techniques are helpful, especially in the beginning. Well, at any time, but um, especially in the beginning. And there's some good ones about watching your breath and, um, excuse me, just coming back to your breath when your mind, after your mind wanders. And really important thing is to be kind to yourself when your mind wanders. Because we, even though, like I was saying earlier, you know, an instructor, whether you have an in-person instructor or you read a book or watch a video, whatever, they'll say, oh, don't worry about your mind wandering, it's normal, it's okay, it's all good, just come on back to your breath. And that's easy um, advice to give, but difficult to actually take in at a deep level. You might be able to take it in for a few times and then, then you go like, well, I'm just sitting here thinking about the laundry or I'm thinking about what Joe said to me. I'm wasting so, time. You know, and I'm like, my goodness, 10, 20 minutes just went by and I was in Paris or wherever, you know, I went. And, uh, and then you get frustrated and that's natural. Um, so I think just knowing that that is natural and um, knowing that we have, especially because of our history, we have this, I'm not good enough kind of thing for most of us, you know, I got to do better or, uh, you know, something's not safe or I can't trust this process or something makes it unstable uh, and that's how we we kind of lose our way and we can't stay with it we get frustrated give up or uh, we maybe torture ourselves over our, our stray thoughts so learning how to just be calm and relax and, and uh, believe that um, believe you're a beautiful person and uh, that you're that you're normal and that all oh, this is normal and then, uh, and then watch your breath, uh, I think is a good beginning, a beginner's uh, activity. And don't worry about mind wandering, just gently come back to your breath. So it's a, it's a form of almost just self-acceptance of, of, of what's going to be almost a failed attempt at what you think it's going to be. Just fully knowing these will be the trials and tribulations of the, of the attempt to meditate. Right. And, and the, the, phrase okay you said was, the phrase you said was perfect, self-acceptance. Mm. That's right. And is that, uh, does that extend to acceptance of circumstance and acceptance of uh, what's your view on the role of acceptance in our lives? Oh, man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guru, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about guru, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, to the extent we can take that lesson, uh, because we're going to have, uh, life is going to have ups and downs for everybody, right? And especially when we have tough moments, um, it's hard to uh, accept that uh, um, it's difficult for us. And to have compassion, self-compassion, self-love um, is, uh, is not easy. Especially when you haven't been taught that as a child. Uh, you have to be correct, you have to do things right, uh, or it's not safe. Uh, these things, and it becomes, it's really hard to be steady. And, uh, and there are situations where it just really is tough, and you have to understand that. For example, uh, death of, a, of a, a close relative is an example, where grieving is natural. Um, and if you, if you take the idea, well, you know, I, you know, I can just push it away, you know, whatever, well, it's just not natural. Uh, you have to accept it, that this is part of life, and grieving is part of life. And you just have to go into it, and, and you do it, and it takes some time. And, to just being gentle and loving towards ourselves, self-accepting. That, that's a great example um, from my personal life of how psilocybin in particular can bring things from the unconscious to the surface. I had a grandfather pass away, I believe two and a half years ago now. You know how grief can distort time. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I didn't have a direct emotional response when this occurred. If, to, the, to all appearances, I might have even seemed to not really be affected by it. 
and I, and I, and it wasn't even that I was um, behind the scenes suffering. It really was that I had really hidden it for a while. Like it was mm -hmm. gone. And I'm sure that relates to what people can do with traumatic events in childhood. Mm -hmm. And the psilocybin was, I have a video where I, I tried to sort of articulate how psilocybin really forced me to go through what felt like the five stages of grief without wishing to. Like I, I, I did a mushroom trip thinking it would be a, you know, I'm a, I'm a 20 year old going crazy on mushrooms, right? And here I am, you know, having a sacred experience feeling as if I need to reconcile the passing of my grandfather with, you know, my own feelings about paternal lineage and things like that. And, and mm -hmm. the true profundity and like awe you have at real obliteration, uh, mm -hmm. things like that, that, that you're able to bury so easily are so hard to bury on these substances. And that's, that's why I don't currently have uh, yet at least a, a video of me really going through a psilocybin experience because in my view, a lot or, or many true psilocybin experiences are just really powerful narratives that you're just, that are, are, are like you said, you, you called them the, the, the washer, right? The celest say that again? Celestial washing machine. Sounds fantastic. It's like you're clean at the end, but you're still shaken up. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have to go through the agitator for a while. Yeah. yeah, indeed. I don't know what setting you have to turn it to. Different people have to do tumble dry, different sheets, you know. <laughs> uh, I think right. that might be a different lever for everybody. That's a great example, though, Quentin. What you talked about is blocking the feelings. In this case, your grandfather's death. A lot of us do that. Not everybody, but a lot of us do it. It's pretty common. I know I did that when my father died. I blocked the feeling. It was very, it was eerie. I like it was like, where is the emotion? There should be emotion here, and yes. it wasn't till you know other times that I could understand the grief and 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 feel the grief and realize it. Um, so we do that. It's and it's not wrong. It's actually right in a certain way. It's a self protection device, a self protection mode. What we're doing is we're just trying to protect ourselves, and it's a natural thing. And this is what we do as children too when we get hurt is we do a self-protection thing and uh, it blocks us the thing is uh, the downside is that it blocks us off from the world it blocks us off from expressing our feelings and feeling other people's feelings and behaving in these ways and having to you know do the addiction is somehow get that that comfort so uh, it's but this uh, not feeling grief is a good example of how we do something to protect ourselves because it's just too painful at that time we just can't do it and um, now, as this relates to really the a large topic in your book, childhood adverse experiences or trauma. So I can I can imagine that I can I, I want to be upfront with my audience. I can't say that I've had a a profound resuscitation of a childhood traumatic experience yet on on psilocybin or or anything of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean it's you know out for the future. But yeah, yeah, I uh, I'm curious what you think what you think the nature of psychedelics are that they allow us to, to sort through these things, to, to sort through these childhood experiences after we've taken this molecule. Right. Um, I think a guide can help because there's a lot of resistance is natural resistance. What I was just talking about, like with the grief about walling it off and blocking it because it's just too painful. Um, uh, so the substances help open up. Uh, they're very powerful. That's you know that's what they do, but the guide can help you. Otherwise, there's just a lot of resistance to do it. Uh, so it's kind of that's the combination that I think that works so well, is mm -hmm. having that person there, who's a loving, uh, supportive uh, person, but skilled can help you find those uh, places and help you start to open up. And so it's a slow process. Start. We'll work there. We'll go there. What happened then? And you know, and mm -hmm. then uh, um, take your time. Um, and then the medicines are very powerful healing. They're healing medicines. That's what I look for. Them. I don't look for them, look at them as um, places to have fun. I look for them as uh, sacred medicines uh, to heal us and also spiritual growth, understand the world. You know, is it just, uh, you know, is it just uh, materialism? I don't think so. Uh, but they can help you with those experiences and understand more. Mm. Okay. I I'm curious if you'd like to talk about that for a second. What? I, I would also say that I don't consider myself uh, a strict materialist. And if by materialist, I mean basically that we live in a world of purely inanimate stuff. Um, what, what are your views on what, what the hell's going on here? You seem to maybe, maybe know a little bit. 
Well, you know, I can just say what I think I know and um, or believe and, or what my experience is, I guess is also fair to say. And for a long time, I just thought, especially trained as a scientist as I am, you know, I thought, well, you know, there was a part when I was younger, I, especially maybe with the peyote, I had kind of a mystical feeling. And then, you know, as years went by and I left those uh, substances behind and there's, you know, career and family and all that. I kind of, in the science, kind of get material, it was getting kind of materialistic. And, um, you know, and then like, you know, and then of course the big question is, you know, who am I? What am I? And then what happens when you die? You know, is it just lights out? Boom, that's it. Or is there something else? Is there something And else? why do I know I exist? Yeah. Con what is consciousness? Um, and med meditation can help with that, but also these medicines can help with what is consciousness you know, who's actually watching? Um, who Who is the observer? Who's moving these hands and feet? And who's um, noting the observer? Well, yeah, well, who's, who's noting? Who's watching? Who is the observer? I, I would say it. Um, not the, you know, not the eyes and the, the sensations, but uh, some uh, difficult to articulate maybe, but this presence that's behind everything. Um, that, that's the foundation of our consciousness. And that, you know, some people in religious traditions would say uh, that's the undying. That's the part that doesn't die when your body dies. And that's the part that can go into other spiritual worlds. Uh, maybe when your body dies, maybe come back or maybe go somewhere else, another plane or uh, whatever. Uh, but um, that's how I see, see the world. And, um, uh, I like this uh, quotation, from, it's actually from a 19th century rabbi who went on a retreat. He said, the, uh, the whole world is a very narrow bridge, and the most important thing is to have no fear at all. Mm. And so if you think about the world as a narrow bridge, we're just passing through. It's a narrow bridge, you know, we go here, we, you know, we, we come in, we start there, we go there. It's just a narrow bridge, we just go through it. And um, it's not like the big thing. It's not like the whole thing. And then if you take that perspective of the spiritual life, then there's no reason to fear. Because you don't, you know, the body grows old and die. And, you know, what's so special about this body, you know? And then the ego. And that's one thing we can work on, too, in uh, psychedelics, is this notion of ego. And what is ego? It's like and, you're reading uh, my mind. I was just about to ask and, you. Yeah. And... Um, and that's something uh, we can work on. Meditation, I think, can also help observing um, ego-centric thoughts and actually working on like, well, who's, you know, uh, am, I really, uh, am I really separate from you, uh, Quentin, or from anybody else? And are, aren't we really just part of one thing? And um, so I think the spirituality that um, psychedelic medicines can help with, um, especially with healing, is to is to get a feeling that we're all connected, and um, that's a good example when you think of racism. You know, the people a lot of talk about racism right now, mm. how just so effing weird it is, and how so sick it is. And when you think we're just all together here, uh, how you save swearing costumes? How you can how you can any people can believe and accept that stuff? But they're mm. they're taught they're taught it right. It's passed on. They're taught it when they're young kids to hate and see somebody differently and so on. But yeah, it's it's really fascinating, you know, being a person of color in this era. And I wouldn't say that I have any particular view that directly lines up with anything you just see blasted online. And so you're just sort of stuck between, well, do I do I identify with this physical form I have and some of the beliefs that seem to have been assigned with uh, this this phenotype that I have, or do I sort of get rid of it all together at the risk of seeming to be a traitor almost. But uh, how can you be a traitor if you've transcended, I guess, the idea of teams or you've tried to at least. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I'm where I'm currently at in my journey. So I find myself being hated by both sides, which might mean I'm doing something right. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, just, I, you I, know, just, I think love and accepting everybody, you know, even though they may some of them be sick, um, just still try to love them anyway. That's personally one of the reasons I have found um, my, I've sort of, I guess you could say, taken my baby steps into trying to understand some Eastern philosophy. And I find this idea of the, 
of the Godhead manifesting itself in all forms beautiful, whether or not it is true or not. I find this idea of when, for example, as I'm talking to you, seeing you as a direct manifestation of the Godhead and recognizing that we're both that, or at least mm-hmm. something that approximates that. Mm-hmm. And it, it gives you an underlying respect, I think, for another person, uh, no matter what they believe. I mean, I can mm-hmm. honestly say that during uh honestly a lot of our culture war over the last four years which you can imagine has consumed a lot of my college years i've been in college during the trump administration Mm. i'm grateful for for internet access to some of these teachings because you can truly lose yourself in this collective anger you you truly can and Mm -hmm. let alone if you find yourself to have the same phenotype as some of the people who are uh Mm -hmm. have just reasons to be upset but perhaps we need to stop (laughs) making these tight associations with how we present ourselves in terms of our matter, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, That's, I guess, some of my ramblings about that in particular. Well, it's really important. It's a very deep topic. And um, um, and, uh, I'm sure many of your viewers struggle with that too. It's because it's natural. It's such a big and important topic. It's been such a sickness in this country. Mm. Um, And uh, just, I mean, the way I, I try to do it is just, like I said, just you recognize it not be blind to it you, you see how it exists and see all the many 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 manifestations of it and of course i'm i have this white blindness too although i really try to be open and see other people's experiences but you know i've been culturally uh affected you know it was impossible not to be uh, but i think it's me, fair to recognize your your inherent biases but it, yeah. I, I think also there's i think as long as we balance it with recognizing the core humanity we all share you know it's like yes i'm the product yeah. of my direct environmental stimuli that shaped all my neurons but i also share the godhead within me um that you have as well yeah you are a manifestation of god period yes i mean you are so you know you couldn't be any more beautiful that seems to be um going back to we spoke earlier about this messiah complex i feel a certain person had temporarily on youtube after a psychedelic experience it it seems that the cure to the messiah complex is that everybody is a form of a messiah if actualized um or maybe maybe if not actualized maybe that's just the beauty of the flow um that's the way i i see that there's a little bit in my book i talk about uh and when i'm talking about childhood experiences and i talk a little bit about religion and um Uh, And there's one point where I talk a little bit about the Ten Commandments. And uh, if you look at the Ten Commandments, none of them talk about how do you, how do you raise your child or how do you take care of a baby? Um, And um, so I I point that out and um, and give a suggestion, especially to new parents, you know, instead of like the first, uh, first commandment is thou shalt not have any God beside me, something like that. And um, instead, uh, if you just say, uh, my baby is God. And then it can affect how you how you treat your baby, how you how you see them, how you take care of them. Uh, so, but also, it doesn't have to be just a baby. It could be Quentin. It could be <laughs> it could be Fred or Joe or Mary. It can be be Chris, and it can be everybody. I had this passing thought the other day of God as sort of the divine child. Uh, you know, sort of this this symbol of renewal, just continually reshowing its face in all its forms, and it's just this eternal, playful uh, child, you may say. Uh, mm-hmm. I, and you can imagine me being a 22 year old. I'm about knee deep in Watts, so don't trust anything I'm saying. Um, just just see me as uh, a, an ego complex trying to figure out what's going on here, and maybe maybe kill itself. <laughs> Well, some people talk about consciousness. You kind of alluded to this or, or pointing to it. You know, some people talk about consciousness as this is God's way of enjoying herself, um, enjoying the, her own manifestation um, and the beauty of the world and a, a way to celebrate herself and her being. You know, it's, it's more than a human brain can totally, you know, grasp. But it, can, it kind of points you maybe in a way that I think is beautiful and can be healthy. I think there is this beautiful idea that omniscience lacks limitation. And that is the fundamental constraint of something with eternal power. It is that it actually does not experience limitation. And so that would seem to be a convenient niche for us organisms to to cohabitate. Well, let let, let us step in, Godhead. Let let us show you some limitation. We'll give you a little flavor, a little Mm -hmm. taste of the limitation. But you you can't remind us. We have to remember right at the end only. Don't spoil the the surprise. Mm It's learning too, right? I mean, it's, and that's a gift. Learning is a gift. And, um, 
And I hope people, especially it could be any age, young people, old people, whatever, uh, always can have something to learn. And and rather than like saying, oh, I should have known that, or why did it take me so long to figure that out? Just uh, say, wow, thank you. Thank you for that gift of learning. Mm. Fascinating. Um, before I, I'm sorry if I've taken up too much of your time here, I'm just so interested with what you have to say. I wanted to ask you about these Buddhist retreats. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I, I was reading through your book and I noticed that you mentioned something I believe called a session. Mm -hmm. and also I believe something else so I would I'd love if you could just explain the different forms of Zen retreat one might be able to attend right well there's different kinds of meditation retreats and there's Vipassana who I, maybe is a little gentler than Zen I might even suggest to some of your viewers but Zen is okay too uh, and all these meditation schools have uh, have retreats uh, as part of it so you can spend more concentrated time uh, practicing it's, it's nice to have a daily practice, that's important, uh, but um, if you want to meditate, but um, going on a retreat for a day or five days or 10 days or whatever, it can be powerful, kind of uh, help you understand meditation more, help you quiet the mind, and sometimes you, you walk out of it, uh, those retreats, and you kind of have a certain sense that you didn't have quite when you walked in. Now it might kind of go away. You have to go get in your car and you have to go over to the grocery store and, you know, talk to your, your, your friend or whatever. And pretty soon you're busy with this and you're busy with that. And it kind of might fade a little bit, but still uh, they can, um, they give you maybe a sense and a feeling of um, what um, a quieter, a more a calmer uh, life is like. Maybe some spiritual insight too. Uh, but um, a lot of people also warn uh, meditators, uh, there's such a thing called spiritual bypassing. I mentioned it in the book and other people yes. like uh, Jack Kornfield, for example, is a very good author of a Vipassana teacher. He articulates this well. And this is where uh, people get into uh, spirituality, meditation, it could be yoga or other kind of spiritual paths. And um, to like, they want to get better, they want to get, Maybe they maybe they think they want to heal and be, and be you know they know there's something wrong they want to heal. <clears throat> maybe they have these egotistical things they want to get more powerful, more you know, more wisdom. I want to get, I want to get wise. Uh, <clears throat> and if they really get into these uh, pa practices like meditation, for example, without without attending to the psychological wounds that they carry, that they um, well they first of all it can be a delusional. And second of all, it can be harmful in the end. And this is uh, one example I talk in the book about um, abuse by spiritual leaders. So um, um, this is pretty common, unfortunately. There are spiritual leaders, many uh, well-recorded histories where they're abusing alcohol or sexual abuse of their students, um, maybe have the, uh, their own un, uh, uh, unsuccessful uh, relationships and marriages, adultery, um, and power, power tries to amplify, power tends to amplify the ego too, so it can amplify these dysfunctions that people have. And those people who are, have those internal wounds often actually seek power. They seek to be a leader, they seek to be, you know, the head mm. of the, the head of the temple, the head of the church. Um, so it's a sickness. Uh, and it's a, in the phrase that was coined by uh, a psychotherapist uh, who also was the Buddhist, John Wellwood, coined the, the phrase uh, spiritual bypassing. And it's a, it's a danger. It happens all the time, very frequent, um, that you see people, especially the zealots in the group, not, not always, but often the zealots in the group, the ones who are really, really going to do it. And... Um, they're covering up uh, this uh, internal pain and, and sitting on the cushion uh, as long as you want is not going to find it because it'll be hidden in their un unconscious. The sitting will not bring it up. Somebody, one teacher, a Zen teacher, likened it to, uh, she was watching some students who were really problems and said, it's like they're sitting in the parking lot. They're just wasting their time. They're just mm. not, they don't get it. They don't see what's happening. Um, so I encourage meditation, but I encourage people to do 
uh, some psychological introspection, and preferably with a good therapist and, and psychological healing. And uh, these psychedelic medicines are wonderful tools in the right hands uh, for, for doing that healing. So um, that's, um, a, that's a word on spiritual bypassing. Yeah, uh, first interested in the spiritual bypassing, but also so interested in, of course, you mentioned Watts in your book as well, this, this seeming, this is what I was trying to get at, this seeming paradox between these people who, in, by all, all perspective, by all perspective to me, seem to be what I would like to be. They seem to be, have recognized what's going on for what it is and to have reconciled that. And yet mm -hmm. they seem to have sometimes abhorrent behavior. So in your view, mm -hmm. I'd love to know, do you think this, mm -hmm. uh, you seem to connect it to this, uh, this pain they have. Do you, do you think this delegitimizes their spiritual practice? What do you think about this? Um, I think that they can have spiritual insights and I think that they can learn some ways and methods to, work with people on to help some people, but without the, the healing, they will be limited as teachers. They won't understand what's happening to their students and they can often hurt their students in ways they don't really even recognize what they're doing. So, uh, and it's really common. Um, so, um, so I don't wanna say that those teachers um, can't be helpful, but um, uh, it can be dangerous too. And um, as re and you know, there's, there's no uh, and the trouble maybe uh, you know it's not that easy you know because somebody gets uh, anointed a teacher you know they say okay you're you're officially a teacher and you know are they really healed themselves and how much insight do they have it's hard to know um, but I would say I'm pretty I say with confidence it's it's common that there's a lot of um, uh, uh, internal pain and uh, psychological trauma that they haven't touched and sitting on the cushion by itself will not help them touch it. Mm. So in your, in your own journey in dealing with alcoholism, I, I'm not sure if you would call it alcoholism, do you feel that there was a decisive point or was it a series of these powerful experiences that, that led you towards making change in your own life? Well, I'm like the unfortunate uh, many who it takes some big life event to make a change. In that case, it was my wife and brother who were pressuring me, mm -hmm. do something. And my wife would say, well, you want, you want me to say being your wife, you know? And, now, and that's great. That was sufficient and, for you then. And my brother was like, you have to, you have to do this. Um, that's beautiful and, in a way. Oh, it was beautiful, very hard to swallow, and it's very tough and difficult and tricky to get between a person and their substance, because the substance is doing something correct. It's, it's giving comfort. It's the comfort that we wanted when we were a child. It's, it's applying that. And so to get in between those two things is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all why the denial is so common. We don't want to go there. That's too, that's too tricky. It's too difficult. We don't want to admit it. Maybe the everyday pot smoking or the everyday beer or, you know, whatever, uh, or the overeating or whatever, you know, all these things. Um, so unfortunately for many uh, people like myself, it took this outside event. Um, and it can be a death in the family. It can be all, all kinds of things, different things, but they're like, boom, something hits you and makes you make a change. Mm. But, um, you know, my, my thing is... Uh, Please, uh, people, you know, just if you can possibly take self-stock, save yourself, yourself a few decades of pain and suffering and, um, and admit it to yourself in front of the mirror and, uh, and love yourself and, and find a way to do something about it and not wait for that big event because, uh, you know, life is kind of short. And um, uh, I would wish I had done this, you know, decades before. Um, and so I want to encourage, especially a lot of your younger viewers to take that opportunity and and learn from people's mistakes like my own. That is a powerful message, my friend. I have chills all over my body, if I'm being honest. I, who knows in this, this Gutenberg revolution of technology we seem to be going through, what that just did, what waves you just sent through, sent through the world. Um, I, w I wanted to make sure, and I'm not sure how we'll edit this video yet, but I wanted to make sure we talked about what the integration period was like after these, uh, these sessions. And, and I'd like to know particularly uh, is it very important that these are done with the same person throughout? Uh, just what your views are like and what it was like. 
Yeah, I, well, I believe it's absolutely, you want to do it with the same person you were with during, before and during the journey. Yeah, the same person. You want that continuity. It's essential that it be done, um, the integration work. Um, and uh, especially early on, there may be, it's not just one session. Maybe sometimes when I do a trip now, there may be just one session afterwards as an integration, but I've been doing quite a, quite a lot of them as, as a growth thing. But you absolutely need to do some integration work. And it's not just maybe an hour talking, maybe several of these hour talking. And there also may be exercises. Uh, your guide might ask you to do something. Uh, uh, I wrote a letter, one, just one example. I wrote a letter to my father, mm -hmm. my deceased father. That was mm -hmm. an exercise as part of the integration process. Uh, but there are many other ones. Uh, drawing, art could be sometimes a very good one. And uh, you can think of your own, but uh, your guide oftentimes will We'll, uh, we'll do that with you. And then, you know, the, your guide will ask you, uh, you know, you'll talk about it. And your guide will ask you uh, about, you know, your experience and why did you say that? And, you know, what, how do you feel about that? And maybe take a minute and maybe go be mindful, drop inside your feelings, take your time, and let's talk about that thing. So you're not just all at the very top level of your consciousness. You can, you can learn that with a little little teaching, little skill, how to drop down deeper into your feelings and, and touching more of the unconscious. And uh, mm -hmm. those are techniques that a skilled person can help you with. Uh, but there's, so integration is extremely critical. And uh, there's also skill to uh, a, a person doing it with you. That, wow, this is a, a great insight for me because, you know, I have a lot of I have a lot of belief in the power of these transformative experiences in people's lives and you know really just looking through research papers as i've become more competent in reading scientific li literature uh but, but hearing it firsthand is is really powerful because you start to think about what this would look like in a country where we had at where people had this kind of access to healing it, it mm -hmm. really is a it's not a type of utopia it's not something that's unrealistic it's a, a very possible direction this country could go and if what you're saying is correct which i'm inclined to agree with you about uh childhood experiences and how they shape our past pr present and future uh, and these psychedelics can allow us to sort of uh, maybe enter the control panel behind these feelings we might really make some cultural change here i mean any mm -hmm. any rational biologist knows we evolve culturally as well so right. i mean as our culture accelerates who knows what humans can create and stop doing to hurt each other. Well, I think that's wonderful. And, and what's happening, we see it, you're, you're right. And um, like the Oregon Initiative is an example. Yes. And that has, a, it's very careful working with the government. Uh, and um, I mean, I think there's a place for a good underground guide, but there's some value of working with the government. So, because this whole period since like around 1970 in the history of mankind is, is an aberration. And people have been using these substances in an accepted, sacred, healing way for millennia. It's been part of the traditions of, of the tribes, of the people. It's hubris, um, truly, to outlaw and, them. And this, this thing is like, a, you know, whatever, a 50-year hiatus is an, it's an aberration. It's not normal. These are wonderful gifts to a people. Uh, but they need to be used responsibly. And there's great value in traditions that teach the, the teach and train people uh, so they can be healers and uh, pass that knowledge on. So what you're, what I think you and some of your, your uh, colleagues and your viewers who are work maybe with the uh, different decriminalization or legalization initiatives, more power to you guys. I think mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Uh, I really, really think it's a wonderful thing. And I'd love to see the young people do it. I go, yes. <laughs> 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 Makes me feel so good. Well, let me uh, consult you more, Obi-Wan Kenobi. So you have referred several times to a type of experience these, these uh, guides have, which is really just exactly that. It's experience through taking people through these, uh, these powerful states. What do you envision in your, let's, let's talk utopianism. What do you envision as the type of education that guides go through in this country? If we, if we truly healed this, uh, like, as you called an aberration we've had in this country, uh, what type of programs are available to learn how to, to many, I guess I'm saying this, uh, because many people that I encounter on my online platform, they are overly enthusiastic about 
maybe not all of them are qualified, but helping people through these experiences. And right. there's going to be a wave of psychotherapists wanting to help. So Right. Well, there's more and more training opportunities. It's going to take a little time <clears throat> because you don't want to, <clears throat> you don't want people who aren't trained because you can actually hurt people if you're not properly trained. And it's, it can be dangerous. So you want people who really are well-trained and that could take two, three, four years, easy. Okay. Um, it's not like a, a, a six month or even a six week course. I really want to uh, caution people about that. There are some schools that are popping up and there, it's also, uh, some of them are underground and some of them are above ground. I think the Oregon one is an example where you, they're, they're going to have this training procedure. And, um, you know, and that's a big topic in of itself. You know, can the government run things be as good as some of the traditional ones? I think there's some limitations there, but it's still, it's a start. It's a step forward. It's a concession I'm willing to make. Yeah, and it's a process. You gotta look at it as a process. We're gonna build over time. And uh, as people understand and, and get more relaxed and understand the value, then you know, new, some other doors will start to open up too. So um, there are some schools are opening up, uh, some above ground, some underground, mostly above ground, um, if people Google uh, around. Um, and some of these are associated with like maps and, and their uh, their uh, PTSD therapy. A lot of your, your viewers probably know about that, <clears throat> where there's training training programs. Some of them maybe not so easy to get into. Some of the, especially the government uh, sent, uh, sponsored or accepted government FDA approved ones. Uh, you might already need a license before you can get into the training. Okay, well if you want to do this and help people, go get a license. Um, it takes a while, it takes some money, it takes dedication, but that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's some underground ones too, but um, stay away from the six week, uh, or I went to Peru for the two online. Weeks, and I'm a shaman now. I had to stay away from those people. Indeed. So, so um, as we get to our last thoughts here, what are your thoughts on uh, maybe the next role of what we previously or still do call the shaman in our culture. Because when I think of the shaman, I think of the archetypal person who can be there as you enter these different states and, and moderate it to some degree. Um, do you see this now occurring in a type of uh, quasi secular spiritual mixture? Like what, what do you see it looking like the role of the shaman? Uh, I think there definitely is a role for the shaman uh, or a spirit guide or you, whatever word you want to use. It doesn't have to be shaman. It doesn't have to be purely traditional shamanism. It can be kind of a, something similar to it. And they usually are people who are trained uh, in some sort of indigenous cultural um, training. It doesn't necessarily mean that they went to Mexico. It could be that they learned from somebody who went to Mexico. Um, and um, those things, they, that might be some of the limitation that you get with um, you know, FDA approved uh, training. Although I don't, I think there can be really value there and they can really help people. But you might miss um, some of those opportunities, uh, people who have missed those opportunities. Although I will say that they're probably, if you look around, even those, um, well, like, they, like the first therapist, the above ground therapist I worked with, it was kind of above ground, but he worked in Peru. He was trained in Peru, in the ayahuasca retreat centers. And so he had that knowledge that he could bring into, into the therapeutic setting. And um, so those people who have been trained by the indigenous cultures one way or another, uh, who are part of that community and accepted by that community through their training, they went through the training. Uh, they can offer something that I think is, is pretty hard to get just by if you go to the nearby university and get a master's and you do so much training in, uh, in psychotherapy, uh, you might not have that. And there is value there. I think I'll, I'll speak firsthand. There is value to have those people who have that kind of training. They can add another dimension of uh, healing and spirituality that I think might be hard to reach if you're, if you're only trained uh, in sort of a Western traditional psychotherapy. Mm. Wow, extremely interesting conversation. That was that was enlightening. In <laughs> I'm definitely going to be rewatching this one. I'll, I'll just say that. Uh, I wanted to ask you: Is there any first last words you'd like to say? And then, uh, would you like to talk about your work for a moment? Um, let's see. First last words. Um, 
Um, the psychedelic medicines are to be respected. Uh, they're great healing tools and work, find a good guide, a uh, well-trained guide. Um, and um, be serious about uh, pain inside. It may be hard to see, but the symptoms will tell you about it. They'll, they'll point to it. And um, I love everybody because uh, we're all together. Um, and, um, and um, you know, I'm, and thank you, Quentin, for having me on. I hope people get a chance to read my book. Uh, ebook or, or uh, paperback, whatever. I'm sure you'll post a, a note for that. Absolutely. And, and um, just a pleasure to talk with you. And, um, and and I know a lot of your listeners are young people, and um, and I hope they uh, avoid some of the mistakes I've made. And, and well, you that's... seem like an absolute role model to me, despite any any mistakes you've made in the past. You seem to have incorporated them in the healthiest context I've seen. Um, it's, it's really been a pleasure speaking with you, Chris. Uh, I want to tell all my viewers to definitely go and get Healing with Psychedelics, Essays and Poems on Spirituality and Transformation by Chris Becker. I'm wondering, uh, when does this release, Chris? Uh, July 7th. This release is July 7th. Also, for members of my Discord, I will be offering an exclusive role for everybody who purchases this. I want to support Chris because he is one of the most egoless people I've spoken to, and he really just wants to spread his message with the world. So, right. thank you, Chris. Yeah, yeah the ebook I'm going to put at 99 cents for a while, so it should be easy to purchase. Wonderful. That's even better for all us, uh, all us college kids out here eating Top Ramen. <laughs> Great. All right. Thank you again, Quentin. Yeah, thank you, everybody.